Okay, so welcome to the UK Sangha. This is uh, Sunday afternoon here, and what, 10 o'clock uh, uh, in the UK now? Mm, it's 9.15. Nine, nine, nine okay. All right, well, next week, starting next week, it will, uh, we'll have the video starting at, at 10.15, unless we all decide that that the nine o'clock hour is better, but it seems like that maybe leaving it to 10 more people join because generally a lot of people join right at the end. Last time, Dag joined just as we were finishing. And so uh, this time zone is an issue that we have to resolve. But meanwhile, Carl had an, a question that I didn't even let him ask because he started the question with the word since. Yeah. So, uh, after talking about the word sense as uh, after an event, we recognize that the teachings of the Buddha don't have to do with an event happening and now you're different. But in fact, this is one of the qualities of the, of the practice of insight is, is that insight gives us insight into what we're looking at right now and we may decide to make a change about that. But basically, insight is a process. It's an unpeeling. Um, and so after we peel off one layer, then we can see the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And so you can say then that every day, several layers are pulling off. Which one of those layer pulling off was an event that we can say, aha, now we've got it. But a much better way of looking at it would be, you know, I have been really keeping track of when I've gotten angry and when I've been sad and what events that happened when I was in that state. And now I reflect back and it's been five years since I've been angry. That that's basically the way of looking at it is, is that we kind of keep track of our successes and our failures so that we recognize over a long period of time that we haven't had that issue. And that this is actually the way that Achan Po, uh, kind of several times we had this talk about events don't mean anything. I remember one time we had a talk about it um, in the sense of uh, he accepted that I was a Sotapan at that time. And then later, he said, well, you know, it's an up and down kind of thing. Sometimes you're there and sometimes you're not. That it's not a fixed point. And that began to give me then the idea that um, that these attainments that people are looking for in the West are um, almost always moving targets. <clears throat> and yet students for uh, in some sense are some situations will go to the teacher and says, I had this and that epiphany, I made this insight, I got this information, and then the teacher says, oh, that makes you a soda pond. Well, maybe it, he was a soda pond in that moment, and maybe he's a soda pond while he's talking to the teacher, but that's no guarantee he's going to remain a soda pond or anything else. The same thing is also with jhana, that people think that jhana is an attainment rather than a natural state of mind that we can get back into. And so uh, we get very event oriented. And then we think that this moment is a special event and it's going to change everything. To in fact, really the only thing that's changing is the individual's attitude. And that attitude change is kind of slow, generally. You revert back to the old attitude quite easily. So, Carl, I invite you to ask your original question in a form that doesn't start with the word sense. Yeah, I, I can see how there, was, how, how there is like a comparison between some, some past and future and, and sense, sense. Yeah, I, I could see that as I'm asking it. Uh, the question, I think, it is how does anything get done? Like, because you will, it's, it's hard to say in that sense, because you're going to be looking back onwards your past self and how much you've done, and you're going to compare yourself. 
and at most of the time you're not able to get those things done because you dissolve them so you just have to kind of let them go and then see how it unfolds that's why i found i think you just uh, we i mean we you know um dig things up from uh, our sankaras so if you understand that that's not what really makes you up maybe it's a story of what makes you up uh you know look past it go through it yeah precisely precisely yeah 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 <laughs> Actually, that's a very good, important point, Marcus, is that we tell ourselves stories. And we and the story is about the event in the sense that the event now is a story. And it's the stories then that build up that change the attitude. When we recognize that there's just stories and that we can change our attitude to anything that we want. And so that's one of the waking up processes is to wake up to um a past memory is nothing but a story now that we're telling ourselves and when we recognize that we tell ourselves a lot of stories then we begin to recognize i don't have to behave or act according to that story that i can behave and act let us say with wisdom instead and so I think, in fact, one time before uh, on one of our Sangha U.S. calls, we were using the term of getting shit done. Was that on? Was that the call that we have here? So you're asking the same question again, just using different words. And that is, how do we get anything done if we don't want to do anything because we don't see anything that needs to be done? The answer to that is, well, why would you do anything that doesn't need to be done? The answer to that is, is because you like it or you want to do it or it's your hobby. In other words, we're talking about the fact that we can change our um, um, our attitude from a work attitude to a play attitude that you begin to play with what you used to work on. Um, actually, I know of um, this guy's probably retired now. I had a fairly interesting relationship with him because he was an ET in the Navy. An ET means electronic technician, and I was fulfilling the the pay billet of, a, of of an ET because an ET pay billet wasn't available. That's what they call it, you know, a place uh, pay billet in in the U.S. Navy. And so I was operating like an ET while I was actually uh, rated as a musician. But anyway, this relationship that I had allowed me to go into the very back rooms, down into the basement, up into the attic to this old building that this guy had. And he was an old style television repairman in North Carolina before televisions became digital, before they became highly electronic. And so uh, he had probably somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 old televisions that had not gotten repaired. And so he would cannibalize them, but he had a ball just playing around with them, remembering, oh, I need this circuit, and I know that that old television that's like this one is down there someplace. And so he goes and moves a field of TVs around and go gets this TV that has the part that he wants. And he kept uh, repairing old TVs, using old TVs, right up to the day he retired, which was quite late in life. And so uh, you guys probably don't even know about a tube type TV or a TV that's built without a motherboard or built without digital electronics in it. But uh, he and I knew all about those old TVs. And so I really enjoyed our conversations uh, with him about it. And the thing that's really amazing is, is that he loved it, even though his profession had gone out of service 20 years ago. Nobody needed that kind of television repairman now. And there he is with his uh, wire clippers and soldering gun and me, uh, uh, voltage meters and a tiny little oscilloscope, and he's just having a ball with it. Why? Because it really didn't matter whether he repaired a television or not. He had fun with it anyway. 
and he had already gotten old enough so that the Navy paid him his uh, lifeline retirement. And so he didn't need the money. He was just there playing in his shop. Which meant that he probably uh, in earlier in life, after he had uh, gotten out of the Navy and, and retired, he was still in that work mentality. And so what I'm talking about is beginning to change our attitude about things from seeing this as a job, seeing this as work to do, seeing that this is important, seeing that we've got to get this done and changing our mentality in is, so it doesn't even matter whether I do it or not. But if I'm having fun doing it, then let me go ahead and do that. Here's a point. Uh, what about which... Was, I don't know which collection it's in, but um, the, the last thing the Buddha reportedly said was uh, strive with diligence or something. All Sankaras are, all was it Skandas? All Skandas are impermanent. And then, uh, yeah. Strive, and here's that English language translation of strive. Mm. And that fits not in with the w translator's view of things, but it fits into the Western mindset. So everybody just picks that up and says, OK, Buddha says, go strive. But the Buddha didn't say strive at all. A much better word that we could use for that Pali word would be persist. Or keep going. You see, striving has the quality of putting in a whole lot of effort right now and then getting tired. But persisting has to do with doing just a tiny little bit of work and then doing it again, then doing it again. A tiny little bit of work. In fact, if we change our attitude, that tiny little bit of work becomes just another toy, just another moment of fun. If we persist in doing that. And so the persistence is the persistence in making things fun rather than bringing it back into striving because people strive at their jobs they strive at uh, uh with their paycheck they strive with their families they strive they strive with their religions and that's part of the reason why everybody is unhappy in our life uh, in the western culture is because of all of this striving that's done that doesn't get a lot of value out of it that in fact, what we need to learn to do is to take the value out of this moment. Which means that we now become playful, but we are persisting in having fun at what we're doing. That these these sand cars are manifold, they just keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. You don't have to beat each one of them down with a sledgehammer. You just pick it like a daisy. But you keep persisting, you keep picking, you keep picking, because if you sled it with a sledgehammer, you're going to wake it up in a dark night of the soul or something ridiculous that Western meditators often get themselves into because they're working too hard to remove a too easy object. It's sort of you know, like. I liked, um, I think it might have been on one of the talks with Alex that you had. I think it was either Alex or one of the group talks where you mentioned that. Um, if you what was it like 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 a weed if you if it's underneath um a pavement or something and it's coming through if you cut off the top of it you know shooting through enough times then it eventually will not regrow i, I really like that mm -hmm. yes as opposed to striving has the quality of let's go get a backhoe and dig up the city's um uh sidewalks and pavement just to get that weed out and now we got to go put the cement back to keep the city happy right that's striving but it doesn't necessarily get rid of weeds because we think that oh if i do all of that work and get rid of that weed then that means i don't have any more weeds to deal with and that's the that's the mentality that has that that is the West of uh, finish it completely. And uh, like an example would be a war to end all wars. Guess what? There is no war that's going to end all wars, but there may be a war that ends your war. When you're dead because you got killed in the war. What did you do in the war, Daddy? I got killed. <laughs> now I'm not at war anymore. 
But other than that, the war keeps going on. Um, the war that is in Ukraine right now is really a war between um, Vladimir Putin's ears. That's where the war actually exists. And he acts upon that, but he's not acting upon it playfully and happily getting stuff done. You know, he could have done something completely different and become the hero in the world's uh, eyes. But the way that he went about it, he's become a pariah. And partly that he's done that because he wants it too badly. He's striving too hard. And so the question, Carl, is, is how can we come out of our striving? The answer is see it when we're doing it and say, wait a minute, I see that striving there. Let me take a moment of persistence to throw out that striving. So let us say the example is that you're sitting at your desk, typing on your computer, answering an email. And you recognize that while you're answering that email, that you're striving for words that it's hard to do, that you don't know how to answer this email. The right thing to do is to recognize that striving and say, well, I'm going to take a break right now. And you go and walk around the block or you go take a deep breath or you uh, sit there with some anapanasati and get glad in the mind or whatever. And then we can come back to that email playfully. I can get this done. There's nothing to it. And then you can write the email happily. So what we've done here is we've turned that email writing from a chore, a task that we normally strive at. And we ch we persistently change that mentality into the mentality of, oh, I like this. Yeah, I can handle this. This is easy enough to do. And so everything becomes kind of easy. Another example of this, this happened recently here, is that I have discovered a bug in the Windows operating system that in certain situations, it will destroy a hard drive's data. It will turn it back from formatted uh, NTFS into a raw format. And I had enough of that done to where I lost both the first and the backup on it. And then I uh, and part part of that losing both of them was, well, wait a minute, I'm the only one that wants that data. Nobody else cares about it. The only one that does care about it is me. Let me go ahead and continue to play with this raw formatted set of drives that I've got and maybe we can find something out. And so I download four or five different programs that all say that they're free and when and after they analyze the disk and find all the files, then they say, OK, we'll actually restore these files for seventy five dollars or something like that. And so after that, and then I remembered that there was an old copy that was set on a set of drives that were uh, spanned, but that the span didn't work anymore. And I figured that um, what the heck, really what was going on was is that a power supply on a laptop only has so much. And when I put too many hard drives on that power supply and try to hook them up by putting an extra card in for uh, uh, SATA, and so what it did is I unhooked every drive except for the spanned drive and the um, drive that had the operating system on it. And it booted up and it brought up the span. And so I didn't lose any data at all. But for five days, I had thought that I'd lost a whole drive's worth of data. Eight terabytes. About what, eight terabytes? Uh, the virtual somewhere between six and 10,000 uh, movies were lost. And I was okay with that. That was fine. But you can imagine that somebody who really cared about it, they would have been over the moon in great pain and difficulty over trying to get that data back and not be able to. They would have wound up spending the $75 to get the data by buying that program. And so this is what I mean is, is that oftentimes when we play with things, get away from it, then another idea will pop up and we can try this, that and the other thing playfully. 
But one of the things we say is, is that, oh, well, that probably won't work. And so I won't bother to do that or this won't work or whatever like that because we're too involved in our striving. And so this is an example of where no striving actually gets the work done because I was persistent with it. Because I was having fun. I was discovering things. Never mind that I had lost eight terabytes of data because I didn't care that I'd lost it or not because it didn't didn't matter. I already, I still had another hundred thousand movies. Why should I bother about losing ten thousand? And yet I didn't lose them at all because I persisted with tinkering with it happily, just like that old ET that Navy uh, technician could repair TVs that years ago could not be repaired because they were important, that somebody owns it, that he was going to make money off of it. And now that he is no longer striving at that and he's retired, he can repair TVs that he couldn't repair 20 years ago. And back then he even had the parts available and now he doesn't even have the parts available. He has to improvise, but he's having a ball. What a magnificent thing to say that I can repair an old TV that was just a piece of junk and now I can put it on sale for $65. And somebody in a rest home would really love to have that old TV because they don't like the new digital ones. So this is an example. These are several examples going back to that cracking that weed off as it comes up rather than wanting to destroy it from the root. That this moment is a moment that we can play. That nothing is as important as we would think. I would go so far as to say that in, the word important is probably the most, let us say, duke-laden word that is in the English language. Because if anything is important, it's that bound to be um, duke when somebody doesn't get what they want because they think that's really important. But if nothing is important, then it doesn't matter that much. And now we can play with it instead. Robert, you got your hand in the air. Yes. Um, when I hear you say, um, don't strive, to some extent that communicates to me, don't do anything, which I find a little bit depressing. Oh, did you hear me say the word do. persist? Persist, right, yeah. Persist. That's the operative word is never mind, start again. Never mind, start again. You see, the striving is the failing. The persistence is never mind the failure, start again. Goenka uses that in his uh, uh, talk about Anapanasati on the first day when the mind wanders away from the breath. Never mind, start again. And yet almost no students do that. For most students in the beginning, when the mind wanders away, they see it wandering away, and then they take an opportunity to really work hard and really persist and, uh, uh, excuse me, really strive and really be down on themselves. Oh, you're supposed to be watching your breath. Why can't you do that? All right, to bring in rules. And so they begin to strive in their meditation. Yeah, Rather it's the than, rules. It's, I, I know it's that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and so let's stop our striving and start playing with Anapanasati. Aha, I caught you. I see that. Yeah, the mind wandered away from the breath. So what? Here we come back again. Never mind. Start again. I can't think of a better, uh, let us say, he, well, he was Indian and he was cremated, obviously. But if he did have a headstone, that would be what should be on Goenka's headstone. Never mind. Start again. That was his uh, number one contribution, I think, to Western Buddhism. And yet, most people don't even understand what he was saying. Never mind the striving, never mind the failure, may, never mind the disappointment, never mind the fact that you screwed up. Start again. Robert just posted something, a quote from uh, Emerson out of the 1830s when he was saying, things like that. He was looking at it in the sense of a day, probably because he didn't have a watch. Western people, they, they know what time is. You've even got uh, some clock displayed right on your screen right now. 
time become very important to the Westerners. They think that time is money. But it's not, in fact, no, the clock actually is what keeps us striving because we're in a hurry. But in fact, the only time that exists is right now, but it's existing and existing and existing. Time persists, but time does not itself strive. People strive because they think they don't have enough time. I've heard students say, well, I'll watch your video when I make time or when I have time. My answer to that was, is, is I ma make time? I've never made time. I don't even know how to make it. I know how to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how to make it. So striving is making time and uh, persistence then would be spending time wisely. And your question, Robert, is exactly the same question that Carl is asking. It's just using different language and different words. So when we strive for things, we actually, the striving has the quality of feeling bad. <coughs> Rather than persisting has the quality of it didn't matter that my last moment of striving didn't work. I'm just going to keep doing it. To keep coming back and keep coming back. And um, what will happen over time is, is that the uh, things that are important to us. Over times of insight after insight is, is that that thing is not quite as important as I thought it was. And now it's not nearly as important that I thought it was. And now it's not important at all. <clears throat> when I came to the point that all of that data that had been lost on those two drives had accumulated to about eight terabytes of data, when I recognized it didn't matter at all, now I can play with those drives to get that data recovered happily but as long as that data is important to me i'm going to strive and fret and worry and all of that kind of stuff with it yeah yeah it's like um it's patience i think be patient with that yes exactly that's an english language word patience and that <clears throat> uh we, we see it as, let us say, an attribute or a skill for individual things, like just be patient, you'll get that or whatever like that. But another way of thinking it, know that patience is better seen as, a, as uh, something that we need to persist at. We need to be not patient with our patients. In other words, when the patience goes away, we just bring it back. Just bring it back. Yeah, just never mind, start again. Never mind, start again. But a lot of people have the idea of patience in the sense that it's important and that it should be strived for. In fact, there's a Christian prayer that I know of that's very many years old, and that is this. Oh, Lord, give me patience right bloody now. <laughs> and in that regard, even patience now is important. No, patience is not important. Nothing is important. The question is, is can I just never mind start again? Persist, persist, persist. So, yes, that and by the way, that passage that you're reading comes in two different places. One is that, that it's in the Udana, which is very, very old literature. And then the next place that it occurs is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, number 16 in the Dinga Nikaya, where obviously they lifted that stuff out of Udana and put it into the Dinga Nikaya when they put in the whole story of the Buddha's death because the whole story of the Buddha's death was in various places and various suttas and mostly in the Udana, and they collected all that together into one story, which is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. And yes, the Buddha does say that's about the last thing that he says, but we mistranslate that into striving when in fact 
the, uh, if you use the word striving in a new way, we can say, OK, it's OK to strive because that kind of striving can be an easy over and over and over and over striving rather than a, um, uh, a big, great big striving that either has a solution or a failure in it. Well, strive seems to be related. I don't know if it is, but it's very similar to the word strife. Yes, it is exactly that we only strive when there's strife. If there's no strife, then we don't have to strive. We just have to keep, you know, persistence. Here's another example of that. Little children, age of five or six, learning to uh, uh, print the alphabet. And some of them persist and they keep doing it over and over again. And their uh, cursive um, writing becomes quite beautiful because they're practicing over and over again. And then there are kids who really want to get it done and get it over with, so they strive. And in the striving, their hand hurts. And then they don't do a very good job. They're not being careful with it. They're not persisting in what they're doing. They're just trying to get it over with. And, they, and those people wind up with very sloppy handwriting when they're adults. Because they, they did persist. Can I say something about striving? So yes, I, certainly. I found that like the thoughts come uh, in, in in couple of forms as as we know they come in words and they come in like almost image like scenarios. As far as like when you say striving, it's almost in, instantaneously blinding. It's like in your face, out mm -hmm. there instantly striving. You know what it means. You have to work hard. You have to get things done. You have to do everything. That's striving. When, when, when somebody mentions striving to me. Well, like, everything is important. And yeah. when everything is important, then we have to get everything done. Yes. Yeah. Because everything's so, important. My question would be, for the, for the Westerners, would, would it be that more, I find myself at least, those thoughts that are visual are a bit harder to catch because they're more in, ingrained in, in, in the society. They're more more like hidden away. Unlike like the stories we tell ourselves, it, it can be like a, a long chapter like a book or, or, or something in your head, but these visual thoughts are a bit harder to notice, I found. So sometimes you will you will get a bit deeper in rabbit hole if you don't pay close attention to these visual things that are happening in your mind. That's correct. That in fact, one of the kinds of research that this is actually more neuro linguistics than uh, Buddhism, but um, Bender and Grinder in their NLP um, began to, um, let us say, use brainwaves and the old neuroscience as best they could to recognize that, yes, there is something happens like that, that, that they call it in. Some people have a see think, others have a see feel. In other words, um, the see think means is that when we have an instant image that flashes in the mind and things can just flash up, an example would be a flash would be that we're driving to work or driving to an interview. And we're just driving and just watching and all of a sudden we have the flash of our resume just flashes in the mind. And the next thought is, is that, oh, no, I didn't bring the resume. Oh, no, I don't have it. And so here we are trying to drive while we're looking through our briefcase to see if the brief and no, all the brief the, is not there. OK, and so now immediate feeling of panic sets in. OK, but it's also possible that we didn't rummage through the briefcase, that we didn't think about it, that we had that visual thought of the um, the resume, and then we immediately go into panic. And we do know that we're in a panic about that um, particular uh, image of the email or the uh, the resume. But quite often, meditators wind themselves up into a kind of a panic feeling that they're not even fully aware of until they start practicing on upon a sati, and then they're aware of the panic, but they don't know where the panic came from. The panic actually came from that flash, that image that popped into the mind and it went immediately into the back part of the brain and turned the adrenaline on. Where other people will have to think about it for a while and then they have to kind of talk themselves into a panic. 
So some people go right from image to panic and others go from image to talking themselves into panic. But we all have these very, very fast images. This very fast image can also be just uh, a verbal. It can be a word. It can be ouch or it can be actually a sensation in the body. But it only lasts for a tenth of a second and then all of this other stuff starts up. And so uh, part of the persistence of the practice is, is to be able to uh, back things up so that when we do feel anxiety, we can say, wait a minute, only a couple of seconds ago, I had a flash that I do know why I'm in a panic. I had a panic because I had a panicky thought and that panicky thought only lasted a tenth of a second, but the panic is still here. And so now how we're going to do it is by stop having those kind of panicky thoughts right now. And start saying, wait a minute, there's no reason to panic. That thing is not that important anyway. I really don't care. It's OK that I screwed that up or it's OK that I forgot the resume or it's OK that this or that happened, that there's no problem here. In other words, we take the importance out of it. And then because it's no longer important when we have that flash of the image of the resume, it doesn't send us into a conniption fit. Because we're better prepared for it because we've got other language that we modify and we begin to change our, let us say, reaction then to those tiny little thoughts. Um, one student had, um, he said that it was, he'd actually chased it down that the anxiety seems to appear on the out breath. And we looked at that and we and we looked at it in the sense of at, at the top of the in breath was when that thought comes. But during the out breath, that's when the um, the actual sensations happen. So be very careful of the kind of thoughts that you're having at the top of the in breath, because those are those kind of thoughts that is the word for Sama Sankapa that's often translated just like the word for persistence is translated as striving we can also see that the word sankara excuse me sankapa doesn't mean a long series of thought it does not mean a concept that we talk about but it's those very quick very instant thoughts that we have that's the samas uh, that's uh, uh the sankapa or another way of saying it is, is that it's not really even a fully formed thought. It can be just an attitude or just, um, uh, what did that guy word? Uh, expectation, right, that would be it. It's an expectation, it's a niggle. It's the way that things are leaning. You can imagine, uh, you, you've all heard and seen pictures of the leaning tower of pizza. You know about that, right? And it's been leaning and they've been working on it for centuries trying to keep the thing from falling. But everybody knows that if the leaning tower of pizza does fall, we know exactly what direction that it's going to fall in. Therefore, they've already cleaned out that whole area of town so that when that thing falls, they know exactly where it's going to fall. People who cut trees down, they cut them in a way so that it makes the tree lean just a little bit so that when the tree actually falls, it falls in the direction that it's leaning. <clears throat> so we can apply those things, the leaning tower of pizza or a tree that's falling. It falls according to the way that it's leaning. So that means that your mind is going to fall in the direction that it's leaning. And so we have to start working on that leaning. And the leaning then is our attitude. Our attitude inclines towards disaster, so we have thoughts of disaster. The mind inclines towards everything's okay, there's no problem here. And so when the tree falls, it falls in a safe place. We know how the mind is going to lean, and so we can actually uh, begin to work on it so that it becomes upright. And when it's completely upright, then it's not gonna fall over. 
And so this is the Sama Sankapa. And how do we deal with that is every time that we have an unwholesome thought, every time that the tree fell over, we can see that there's that leaning there. And so we can now say, all right, well, I don't have to feel that way. The things are actually okay. I do not have to strive now because the tree fell down. But I, I could just watch see, how I'm cutting them better. But I could see how people get frustrated with Anapanasati, how it doesn't work because they're still having that visual thought as they're doing it. For example, when I, I, I started noticing those, um, I, I shift my attitude into, I take a breath, everything feels good. And then I watch it as I let go, I put a gladdening mind thought as well. I don't allow the mind to take the control back of the, of the, the visual aspect as I'm letting the breath out, as you could struggle because when you're letting out, you're going to get anxiety if you're moving your mind towards that direction. Excellent. Yeah. That sounds like success to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so then we begin to develop the feeling of success. Hey, I can do this. Hey, I don't have to have my trees falling over on, on houses or whatnot. I can begin to look at the way the mind is leaning so that we can set it back up right again. Robert, you got a question? Um, yes, this question is for Carl. And uh, it's what kind of visual thoughts do you get? What do they normally it, look like? It, well, my the body, uh, I've been I've been I've been trying to not identify with the body because the body I've been having some chronic pain. So whenever that chronic pain comes up, you would have a thought, oh, my belly hurts. And then you have an image of how everything in your day goes bad because your belly hurts. So it can be very right. instant. Right. It's like one sensation in the body can indicate your whole day crumbling together. So you you, you got to be very careful with the, the images that you put in your mind eye. But they're very subtle, as, as the mother said. They yes. can be a sensation, yes. they can be uh, a small, really subtle, really subtle. More subtle than the words, I find. The more the stories takes like time to talk yourself into like a bad state. But these ones are very subtle. Mm-hmm. Well, we use that kind of word subtle, uh, perhaps an easier word for understanding is that they happen quickly. They don't last yeah. long. Um, I've had students talk about background thoughts, that there they are watching the breath and then they have background thoughts. And the answer to that is no, you don't have background thoughts. It's very much like that you're uh, like an old style television where you have the dial and you turn it from channel to channel. And and we used to do that. We used to take the TV and what's on this channel, what's on that channel, what's on that channel, what's on that channel, and just spin them back and forth and just be on one channel just for a little second. We couldn't then say that the other channels are in the background. We would say that no, they're in the foreground, but they're only in the foreground for a short period of time. That there are no background thoughts. They're just thoughts that invade and come into the mind. And if we're aware of that, that there's no such thing as background thoughts, then we can see when those background thoughts happen, we can see them as, oh, that's just what's happening right now. Never mind, let's come back to the meditation and start again. But most of the time, people say, how can I get rid of those background thoughts? And now they're striving. We don't get rid of the background thoughts, but we persist in seeing them and then changing them. So it's not a matter of getting rid of stuff, because that's striving. It's a matter of dealing with it when it happens. That's persistence. Yeah, I'm Robert. Trying to get rid of anything. There's nothing that important. <laughs> Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, Robert. This kind of relates to the question you asked on Wednesday, as far as you asked, you said, you find yourself enjoying the sadness. That's that's th that at that moment, I would say you were having that visual thought because you couldn't. You you said you couldn't. Anal you couldn't analyze and see the story you were telling yourself, but probably you were having a lot of visual things coming your your way that you were not dissolving. So that's why you were. Yes, I wasn't even seeing them. I wasn't even aware that those were there. Yeah. Um, do you ever get colors? Like sometimes when I'm suffering, um, I'll have like the color red. And that's one of the less subtle ones. I'm not sure. I think I think that would be the conditioning how, how you see color red and how uh, maybe somebody else sees color red. It might indicate different things like, you know, we don't have the same uh, image of red. Would that be right? kinesthesia or something? 
yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, then in fact, say, for me, sensations, words uh, are, are like small pinpoints. Yeah. Right. In fact, that's something that you can investigate, Robert, is uh, b by looking at actual real colors. Look at how they affect you. What do these colors mean? Because color is used in many, many different places. A, a clear example of that now is the color of sky blue and light yellow together. What are those two colors? Those are the colors of the Ukrainian flag, and they're all over now all over nobody knew about the ukrainian flag two weeks ago but now everybody knows those colors and they have that uh that quality to it okay so the other thing would be in the colors combinations like red white and blue or how about green green black and red everybody knows the rastafarian colors right uh there is um <clears throat> you know the chinese uh government's flag, you know that it's colored red and gold. You also probably have uh, heard, in fact, Marcus uh, can verify this. Marcus, have you been, uh, you have seen gold shops in, in Thailand by the tens of thousands? Yeah, yeah. Right? Have you ever Same seen colors. any of those stores selling gold in blue and yellow colors? No, they're Not all like chance. red and gold. Yeah, they're all red and gold, just like the Chinese flag, that this is actually quite an Asian thing of that quality of red and gold. And in fact, guess what is the color of the roof of most temples that are in the cities in Thailand? Marcus, what colors are they? Uh, red, red and, and gold. gold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got it. OK, in the cities, you're right. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not not so much outside of the cities, I found, um, but definitely in the city, yeah. Yeah, right. That's that red and gold mentality. So colors have um, stories. As Carl was pointing out, red to you doesn't mean the same as red to someone else. For instance, the color red means something different to the Republicans than it does to the Russians or to Putin. And that same color red means something different to the Chinese, and it means something even different than that to the Thai. And for you, red, uh, in, in fact, there's, uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a joke that was actually an, an advertisement. There was a place called South of the Border that was just across the border from North Carolina on Highway 301 when there was a huge amount of traffic going between uh, New York and Florida. And that this was a tourist trap, a great big tourist trap. They almost went out of business when the freeway was built because then the people would just go by. But it was a good place to stop for the night. It was halfway between New York and Florida, or actually Miami. And so they had billboards up, and one of the billboards that they had up would be uh, the guy, by the way, who had the south of the border, uh, the, uh, the mascot was Pedro. And so the sign would say, Pedro sees red when you go Russian by. Do you get the joke? Pedro oh, sees red when you go Russian by because Russia, you oh, are red. Oh, joke? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> and Pedro sees red, which means he gets angry. You see red and feel sad. So recognize that these colors have these effects upon us. That's a very good point, Carl. You're really, really spot on with that. That visual images of colors. I know, I've already looked. I see how dark your back wall is. <laughs> yeah. Blacks and uh, whites uh, and dark blues. And yes, I see those colors. Yeah. And the There's colors. There's a lot of reds as well on this side. I'm Pardon? worried there might be too much. I'm worried there might be too much red, and it's um, it's impacting my vibe. <laughs> no, the impact of your life is what chose the colors, not you, not the colors that impact your life. That's a, that's really interesting.
the colors only impact you because you're in the habit of being in, impacted by those colors in that way. That's also very, very interesting. <laughs> wow. You give me a lot to think about. And when you are able to see how those colors impact you, now you have a choice. When you don't see how the colors impact us because of our habits, then we don't have any choice about it. All Pedro sees red when you go rush and buy. He doesn't have a choice about it. I think a good example would be when the sky is cloudy and most people go out outside and they look up in the sky and they're like, ah, no, not good, not good weather. Yeah, you know? the weather's the bad. The goes instantly sour. Mm -hmm. And the sun is shining right now and the sky is clear and you can visually see it. People are like smiling, happy. That's the images we have built in culture as like the conditioning, how strong it is with colors and... and Wow. Absolutely. Not only that, but the movie makers know that and then put filters on their lenses and things like that to create the mood. So a very happy, bright, sunny movie is going to have bright, happy, sunny sunshine as their thing. Uh, this came up in one of our talks. Uh, I think it was yesterday when someone was saying that their girlfriend went to the makeup counter and said that they wanted to buy this kind of makeup because they saw it on TikTok. And the girl, and the woman at the uh, uh, the store said, oh, don't buy that makeup, that the images that you see on TikTok are um, adjusted. They're uh, photoshopped. They're no good. And that they thought, and the woman uh, who was buying the makeup thought that that was a big surprise. Why would anybody want to change a photo? The answer is, is that they were, have been changing photos since photos. How much light exposure determines what the image is? And not only that, but in the 1930s, when Technicolor was invented, the Technicolor invention had to do with what chemicals were going to mix to get what kind of colors out of this image that is uh, being presented and normally is done with uh, silver nitrate is what the, the primary uh, ingredient is. It gives uh, black and white, but we can also do brown tone. Many old movies are done in brown tone. This was in fact, brown tone was the opening of the door into color. But now you can see that, uh, for instance, if you've got a, a dark gray kind of movie, and I use the gray intentionally, then they will have dark gray skies in that movie. So the movies themselves know about these psychological things that people have, and that's and so they they invent the mood to do it with music also. That if you have a girl that's walking slowly down the hall and looking and you're playing bright music, then you're looking for a pony. But if you have a girl walking down the hall in the same way and you're playing very dirty, dark, remote, remorseful music, then they're thinking, oh, there must be a gorilla or uh, Jason. <laughs> or this may be Friday the 13th because that's the kind of movie that they have and everybody's saying oh don't go down that corridor oh it's dangerous down there and often in the movie the girl will get to the end of the corridor open the door and there's nothing to it and yet the people have been all um, uh, ready for that this is a terrible thing if she opens that door she's going to get bloody and nothing happens all right. How do the people anticipate that in the movie is because of the music that they're playing and the lighting of the scene. Not necessarily the actress being a good actress. So this is how visual images affect us, Robert. Be surprised at how much things affect us. And if that's the case, yeah, I am surprised, then, yeah. Yeah, so in that case, yeah. maybe the best place to do is go back to our na natural surroundings, open sky, open air, greenery around. That's why I live on the porch is because it's a marvelous place to be with all the colors and the bright sunshine and the blueness of the sky right now is actually white. Not gray, but it's cloudy, but it's a white cloud in the afternoon. Mine right. too.
So this is really an important point then that we've been dwelling on here, Carl, is not only are these images come sometimes with a tenth of a second that we could call instant by used by defining a second to, or uh, an instant as a tenth of a second. These things that happen in the mind in a tenth of a second, those images that pop up, can actually the colors in that image determine how we're going to feel. We don't even have to tell ourselves a story to feel bad. Oh, I see red, therefore I'm angry, or I see blue, and therefore I'm uh, blue. That they image the colors themselves go right into feeling that in fact that image was a thought. It was a thought, and we have that thought feel um, sequence that Bander and Grenda were able to put together. Yes, Robert. Um, I've thought of an answer to Carl's first question, and um, it also leads into a question of my own. And it's that I heard someone say in the Sangha a while ago that um, if there is something to do, you're not practicing Anapanasati correctly. And so my question is, when we are not practicing Anapanasati, is the only thing to do to practice Anapanasati? Or another way to no, phrase it would be, if, we're, if we're suffering, is the only thing to do? No, I would say it like that, then in fact, in that regard, you could turn that into striving. Almost in the sense right. of, oh no, something right. about to happen bad. Oh no, I've got to keep watching. Oh no, I should be doing this. Oh no, is this way? Yes, yes. Ah, I can see how I was much. doing that, yeah. Right, so another way of doing it is just to relax in the sense of everything really is already okay. And I don't have to be that on guard, but just enough on guard to where any dukkha comes into the mind, I could see it. And so we take a much more relaxed approach because already everything is okay. That the striving comes from the point that everything is hard and everything is bad and everything is important. And you have to be on guard all the time. Shit can yeah. happen any second. The answer to that is enjoy your life. And when shit comes, get it, see it before it grabs you. And stop working so hard. So what if a little duca got you? You'll get over it. If you see it quickly, you can get out of it. Don't worry so much. Because we're not trying to achieve anything anyway. The idea with all of that is, is that, oh, if I keep doing that and keep striving and keep grabbing every unwholesome thought, then someday I'll be enlightened. Well, what in what is enlightened in that case is, is then I don't have to be on guard anymore because there's no more dukkha. All right. Well, the answer to that then is, well, right now there's no dukkha. Why should I be on guard? I should only be on guard when there is dukkha. And so after we throw the, the dukkha out, then we can rest for a moment with, with those wholesome thoughts because we now we know they're in wholesome thoughts. Mm. Could, could I talk about some Zen for a second? Cause, sure, um, Zen. Yeah, that, yeah. There, there's some of. there's some nice Zen stuff. Like, um, for example, the story of uh, um, someone approaching some master or, or something and saying, do you meditate to become enlightened? And he says, no, I meditate because I am enlightened. I'm just sitting here because I'm already enlightened, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but if, if you re reframe it, then uh, it can it can be quite nice, you know. That nowhere to do, uh, nothing to do, nowhere to go thing is um, is also quite zen, and uh, or maybe just all, directly, you know. Mm -hmm. Straight zen to the point. always have the story already of zazen. Is you're already enlightened, just sit here. <laughs> you're already enlightened, just sit. Mm. And one and one other thing, which I think. Um, I'm forgetting names. It's like it's like the big name of of, of Zen. Um, um, so some guy, some guy, said uh, that enlightenment is the practice. Mm -hmm. That when you're actually practicing, you are enlightened. Yeah. So enlightenment is the practice. I like that. And, one. and when we forget to practice, 
would be let the Duke take over the yeah, mind. And that's, that's, that's just when, the path. Mm -hmm. And so if we're sharp and we can see these visual images come up, then these visual images, we can see what effect that they have on us. Light blue makes you feel blue, gray makes you feel gray, red makes you feel hot, red makes you feel rich, whatever it is. Uh, we can recognize how these colors have effects upon us and because we have that knowledge, we have the ability to make a change. We don't have to have red doing the same thing over and over again. We can change how we feel about the color red. I noticed something interesting um, while Marcus was saying all that, which is how the, um, the the sort of the stages or levels of of enlightenment, the four paths, they're called paths, and they're not called attainments. I thought that was quite interesting because the path kind of it does imply that that um that process orientation as opposed to mm -hmm. a results orientation that you were talking about. I thought that was quite cool. Because you mm -hmm. walk a path, it's impermanent. It's something that happens. Yeah, it's not. It's All not right. stage. There's, it's not a thing. There's actually yeah. a three-stage practice if you want to think of it this way, and that is the first stage is the waking up process, the knowledge, the knowledge of who we are, the knowledge of the effect that society has upon us, and the knowledge of what is and is not the proper method to deal with. Who am I and who I'm not and how the world works? These are the first three fetters, personality view, sila bhata paramasa, and doubt. Doubt about what is the right path and what is not the right path. So this is generally the hallmark for the soda pond. But the soda pond has more to it than that, is, is that when you really understand that this is the path, without a doubt, this is the way, this is the practice, and everything else that I have been doing all my life was not the practice. When we get that, we get really enthusiastic about the path or about the practice. And that enthusiasm, that eagerness, and that joy that we get from the practice, that's really the hallmark of the Sotapan. That's the fruit. So the path of the soda pond is these three knowledges and the fruit of the soda pond is the relief that we feel because now we know what to do. Then the second part of the path is that now that we have the skills, now that we have the knowledge, now that we know what we're looking for, we can begin to actually deal with greed and ill will and ignorance. In fact, we've already been dealing with ignorance. We just dealt with it by getting these three knowledges. So now that we've got the knowledge and have and uh, have gotten through that level of ignorance, we can deal with the greed itself directly and the ill will itself directly. When we get those finished and there's a process and that is, is that we can um, in the first step, would be to get rid of most of it and have just kind of a little bit left. In other words, <clears throat> I no longer now plan on robbing a bank, but I do plan on shoplifting. So that would be movement from heavy greed into very, very light greed. Okay. And then we come down to no more shoplifting at all, but the desire for the shoplifting is still left in the mind. This would be the state of anagami, to where the anagami doesn't act upon any of the crap that he's still got left in his mind because he's sharp enough to not let it get exposed. This is why we call it rupa versus a rupa, is because uh, when people have actual greed, actual ill will, they will take actually actions that can actually be seen, real things. But at the state of the anagami, he's gotten to the point that he's not going to act upon that stuff anymore. But he still got it as a source inside. And so when he begins to do that stuff, uh, by paying particular attention itself to not the winning and losing, but the conceit and the competition itself. But hey, I don't have to compete with everybody. 
we begin to see that I've already won every competition or lost every competition that I've ever been in based upon my set of rules that I've built into my mind. And if I start to change the rules in my mind, then that means that I can win every battle. I can win every argument. I can win every, I do win every contest. And if I do win every contest because I know how to set the rules, I stop competing because that's too much work. And what value do I get out of the competition? I get no value out of the competition. And before I used to get value out of the competition because when I won, I feel good. Well, now I feel good yeah. whether I win or lose. And so I don't have to go win anything or lose anything anymore to determine how I feel. I've already got that under control. So right, that's right, where the right. arrow height comes yes. in. So we now have now, you can see a three-phase system. One is we can see it from the perspective of, I don't know what to do. Therefore, I am stuck with the Tuka. Then we get that first one, and that's the knowledge, the knowledge of the deliverance. And then we begin to work on the deliverance. First, we take care of it on the outside so that it doesn't show. And then we take care of it on the inside. Now, a lot of people think that, oh, this has to be done in that one, two, three steps. You can't do any of the uh, step three until you completely completed step one. The answer to that is no, we can work on all of them any particular time. There is no real hard designation between a soda pond, a soda gami, or an anagami and an arahat over a long period of time, but it does have a determination in this moment or at this time, you're behaving and therefore are an anagami. You've still got a little stuff left, but you're not letting it out. Versus yes. all. Yeah. OK, that's nice as well. You can play with all the different batters and the different hindrances and you can mix and match which ones you're trying to remove in a given moment. Exactly, exactly. That we turn this whole thing from a war into a game by changing the rules. Um, are, are the terms greed and sensual desire interchangeable? Um, let us say that uh, we have a whole lot of different words that can be used that, that have gradations of sexuality. So hardcore lust is what will cause a rape scene. The sensual desire does not cause a rape scene. But uh, the sensual desire can develop into hardcore lust. Just like you can uh, hate somebody, but you don't act upon it, but you tell your friends, you get angry when you see them. But if you really hated them, you'd go clobber them every time you saw him. And if you really, really hated him, you'd just kill him. OK, so there's these degrees in there that we have to look at. And uh, the way then our practice is, is that uh, we can recognize that these degrees get built up. I can literally talk myself into hating somebody enough to want to kill them. Mm. How do we do that? We keep dwelling on it. The question is, when are you going to wake up to the fact that you're planning on doing great harm that's going to give you great suffering as well as others great suffering. And that can happen whether it's greed or ill will. In fact, another way of asking the question is, is, is greed and ill will the same thing? The answer is yes, they actually are the same thing. You want something, which means you want to be free from its absence. So you hate being uh, separated from it. Because you want it. And if you see it like that, you say, oh, well, hate and greed are the same thing. Mm. Wanting something mm. or wanting to get rid of something are the same thing. Wanting to get rid mm. of the absence of something. And so this is real wisdom to recognize that, that our greed is for uh, the destruction of the ill will against not having it that we feel incomplete, insecure. Oh, I saw that car. I know that car is a chick magnet and it will get me all kinds of chicks. I really got to have that car. I hate not having that car. 
Thank you. That was a really clear explanation. Yeah, they're all they're all very interconnected. Everything is deeply yeah. interconnected and it always brings grind us back into we have a choice. Are we going to ignorantly feel bad because we either got or don't got what we want or don't want? Or are we going to wake up to the fact that, hey, I can be satisfied and not get what I want? I could be satisfied with not getting what I want. That's an important point along the path because mostly we say, oh, I want it. And the next step into the greed is, oh, I want it. I've got to have it. I can't live without it. And you hear guys talk about a particular girl that way. Oh, I can't live without her. Well, yes, he can. That's just, you know, that's delusional thinking. That's real ignorance that he's got there. Because, of course, he can live without it. He can't live without the next breath, but he can live without the next meal. He can live without the next bed, but he can't live without the next breath. So let's get priorities going here. He can live without that girl, but we feel like we can't because we're clinging or we're grasping or we're holding on to it so tightly, mm -hmm. not recognizing that how tightly we hold something is the dukkha itself. I if am that hold, relationship. I am that relationship. I got to have that thing. OK, so um, there was also a demonstration that I saw on television, which has some value to it, but it's not exactly correct. The guy uh, said it like this. He picked up his cup of coffee that had coffee in it, and so it's got some weight. How much does it weigh? And the students in the class saying, oh, well, it weighs like eight ounces or eight ounces of water plus the cup etc like that maybe 10 12 14 ounces maybe a full pound and the guy and then the teacher says well it doesn't depend upon how many pounds it weighs i ask how heavy it is because um if we have a thought and that thought only lasts a moment like i pick up the cup and i hold it for just a moment while i'm taking a sip and put the cup down it's not heavy but now that I've been holding that cup here in front of the camera for this period of time, full of coffee, it's beginning to get heavy. And if I hold this cup for an hour, it really will be heavy. And if I hold it all day long, it's going to be too heavy for me to handle. I will sometime between the next 20 or 30 minutes either put the cup down consciously or drop it because it's too heavy. So now I'm going to take the opportunity to happily set down this heavy coffee cup. The question is, do we do that with our minds also? If we have something on the mind and keep thinking about it and keep thinking about it, it will get heavy. Why do we keep thinking about it? Because every time we continue to think about it, it becomes more and more important, just like holding the coffee cup. Even though it's getting heavy, somehow it's important for me to show you how heavy coffee cups get. And so I hold it even though that it gets heavy in the hand. Right. Wisdom will say that if things have on the mind and on the mind and on the mind and they start getting important and start getting heavy, the thing to do is to throw that stuff out. That's the dukkha. Not that you picked up that thought and had that thought just one time. It's how that thought affected and how you kept going back to that thought or back to that color, keep holding it, keep thinking about it, keep thinking about that girl, and that girl gets more and more important because we keep thinking about her until we get to the point that we think that we can't live without her. Really what that means is we've just been thinking about her a lot, wanting her a lot over and over and over and over again. But if we see that girl and say, oh, she's beautiful, but I don't want her now, we can just throw her out on her mind. She wasn't heavy at all. Her beauty was not heavy. But if we keep thinking about it and putting it on the mind and holding it and repeating it over and over again, it gets heavy. It gets important. Yes, it gets important. Yeah. It gets more painful. Uh-huh. Could I talk about um, the later steps of Anapanasati? Um, throwing it back uh quenching I, I can't remember w which order it comes in actually uh but throwing it back to nature is how bhikkhu buddha dasa might have phrased it that's how it was translated okay uh you're talking about the fourth tetrad 
uh, Dhamma Nupassana, and that uh, there's basically two ways to practice that. And these two ways of practice are called the wet and the dry. This term wet and dry didn't exist in the time of the Buddha because the dry method wasn't done. Basically, what the dry method is, like the noting in the Mahasi, is go immediately to the fourth tetrad and start looking at things as they arise and they pass away. This is also how they practice Vajrayana in the sense of choiceless awareness. Just be aware of what's going on there. But the Buddha's method is different than that. The Buddha's method says, no, we need to work on the Satipatthana early parts to get the body, the feelings, and the mind free from dukkha. Once the mind, the body, and the feelings are free from dukkha, that means that we're in first jhana and that we feel really good, we think really good, and we are free from hindrances, free from dukkha. Now what we're looking at is phenomena, reality, not dukkha arising and passing away, but we're looking at what really is real, what is really wholesome arising and passing away. And we recognize that that too is just everything is just in flux. Things are just arising and passing away one after another, almost willy nilly. The reason that it seems willy nilly or random is because we do not have the perceptual capability of seeing the intricacies of how fast the, the universe operates in the cause effect. We just can't see everything. Human beings are way too slow. In fact, we have uh, humans have developed um, very, very high speed cameras that are quite remarkable. An example of that would be a, um, uh, a high speed camera that is then played back at regular speed of just a drop of water falling. For us, we just see a drop of water and then we see splatter. But if you've got very, very high speed film that's running maybe 20,000 frames a second, then we can see as that drop falls, it begins to wobble. It begins to move. But that drop of water is not stable at all. And when it begins to touch the, the bottom, it becomes flat on the bottom while the rest of the top of the drop caves in on it. And that's what causes the splashing effect is the top of the drop hits the table later than the bottom of the drop. But we would have never seen that with a human eye. Can't be seen. It's too fast. And when we recognize how fast things are changing all the time, that's okay because it's all wholesome now. So we can begin to see the arising and the passing away of wholesome. This is why in Sutta number 111, going back, that's a, such a remarkable Sutta because it's almost the culmination of what to do once we get the mind fit for work, is that we look at how we got the mind fit for work. Wait a minute. You're saying that what do we do when the mind is fit for work is to see how we got the mind fit for work as opposed to when the mind is not fit for work, all we can see is the crap. We see the dukkha. We note the dukkha, and there it is. But if we practice correctly first and get the first jhana and that we are free from unwholesome thoughts, free from unwholesome feelings, now we can see the arising and the passing away of applying the mind, sustaining the mind. We can see sukha directly. We can see its components. Oh, I feel sukha because I feel safe. I feel comfortable. I feel satisfied. And then we can see pity in the sense of, oh, I feel it as success of a wow sensation of, well, we could do this. It's the winner's position, the success. And so this is what we're actually going to take as objects of the arising and the passing away is the jhana factors themselves. And then we move into really investigating the sukha and the uh, the pity. And this is when we're really investigating it, which means that now we're not thinking about it. We're just fully in the experience of it. And that's second chakra. And then when we melt that into just the experience of sukha, that's the third jhana. And so these jhanas are nothing. There's nothing special to them. 
depending upon what you're paying attention to. And if you're paying attention to whatever happens, then that's just a dry practice. Mm. And it and it keeps the mind polluted. But if we take it's, that, but if we take it from the beginning, all that's do can throw it out and get the mind fit for work. Now we can go through the jhanas very easily. Go ahead, Robert. Um, it's interesting how you mentioned those last um, few steps of fourth tetrad um, in in the third jhana. The fourth tetrad might be all you need to keep the mind wholesome is to just keep looking around or not do anything at all. Even you just let go of the whole practice. You just sort of um, surrender to the experience. And and that's that's maybe how you how how you practice then. But th then in the earlier stages, if you try to do that, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. You just you're just stuck it, with dukkha everywhere and you're just noticing it. It's mm -hmm. a bit awful. That's why it's so, so important in the beginning and in the middle stages of the practice to be good at catching these little thoughts that come up that get us into bad feelings or these little thoughts that come up that get us into a panic or get us thinking in a certain way. And then we continue in that way until it gets very, very heavy for us. Okay, uh, so, so um, investigating chitta or I suppose the mind and and what the mind is doing. I thought that was the third tetrad. Um, I understand. Yes. I, I know well, going moving on to the fourth tetrad, um, seeing impermanence. Um, I think that's where it starts off. Yes, that's the whole point is, is that when the mind is stable, because we're in the first jhana, we can see things arising and passing away, arising and passing away, and arising and passing away very, very quickly. We get in tune with the fact that everything is in Nietzsche. Everything is in turmoil. One of the examples that I use is you've heard about the Big Bang, a big explosion that happened starting 13.7 uh, billion years ago. And I said started happening because the universe is still exploding. It's still in turmoil. It is still just all falling apart. It used to be unified, and now it's just disintegrating. Everything is just falling apart due to the law of entropy. Everything is subject to change. That um, uh, oxygen molecules allow, uh, really like to be attached to other molecules so that they can feel some completion. And so you have oxygen, then, which is O2, or ozone, which is O3. But as soon as any of that oxygen comes anywhere near a carbon atom, that carbon atom will chuck its uh, relationships with the uh, hydrogen and go suck into that carbon. And so that carbon and oxygen, when they hit each other, is a tiny little explosion. It's a tiny point of heat. This is why we're warm blooded. We're warm blooded because carbon and oxygen collide together. Mm. Okay. okay, so yeah. in that regard, we're talking about things happen really fast. So much is happening. Think about how many chemicals you had to have going on inside the brain in order for you to have the thought of the color red. Wow, that really puts things in perspective, actually. And so, uh, how, what about the throwing it back then? Uh, is, is throwing it back directly after after impo after looking at the impermanent characteristics of each preceding step? Yes, in fact, you could think of this as the past and the present, where they meet. Because everything is in turmoil, everything is in Nietzsche, everything then means anything that does come into existence will immediately fade away and then cease. So is, is the throwing it back then just the recognition that it's not in, it, whatever's coming up is not important because you've already got what is important in the fact of that you, you guaranteed happiness in somewhere? That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is we threw it back because by the time it has ceased, it's time to throw it out. It's dead now. Right, because it's no longer reality because it's we're already no seeing the past. It's no longer reality. Yeah. <laughs> it's already in the past that, in fact, the human mind works that way, that we've got a, a, a time window uh, that lasts about two or three seconds. And that's as long as that time window lasts. But what we will do in that time limit, that time window, is try to keep that present moment going 
when in fact it's over now. Mm. And so what we have to do is let go of the old moment so that we can uh, have the experience of the arising of the new moment, which is now going to pass away and we need to let it go too because we got something new coming up, which now just died and is rotting away and we need to let go of it too. So this is where things become a dance. A dance is not getting stuck with your foot in one place. You keep moving around because reality is continuously moving around. If we learn to dance, right? So it's lit- literally dance. moving out, moving out of ignorance and and seeing seeing the moment for what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought of something, Damarasu, when you said that about dance. It's interesting how when we're really strongly craving something, it's like we put all of our um, energy into desiring just this one permanent thing. But when we're not craving something, our energy is into desiring whatever's sort of leading to satisfaction in the next moment. So our our mind isn't we're not on one object. We're not um, solidifying like one object uh, into something permanent. We're kind of just moving around and the mind is switching from all the different objects to keep itself satisfied. Mm-hmm. Precisely. So, so. It's like, yeah, it's yeah, we're moving. Yeah. So we can say then that we use the word reality for two different things. One is the reality that is the reality. The tree is real, the bush is real, the sun is real, this arm post is real, the coffee cup is real. Everything, these physical things are real. And then there's another reality and the other reality is the experience of the human. And the closer those two realities are together, the less dukkha there is. And the further away our perceived reality is from actual reality, the more dukkha there is. And this fits in right in there, the fact that the dukkha comes from not letting go of the fact that things have already changed. By the time you can see it, it's gone. And something new is there. Mm. 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 Yes, we're not clinging to what brought us happiness in the past or something imaginary that we think will bring us happiness in the future. We're clinging to the moment, which is always changing. So we have to always be changing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, just keep changing. Keep dancing because you're in a dance. You're on a dance. Those sea legs. (laughs) Yeah, getting those sea legs. Exactly. That's (laughs) the equanimity is that you go with the flow. You can dance with the tune. Yeah, but the tune we have to be able to he- uh, hear that tune, and we have to be able to see those dance moves that the reality is making because it's happening fast, <laughs> so fast, so fast. <laughs> so fast. And so, getting the mind out of that four to five second reality time period down to within the second, and then down to a tenth of a second, that's when sati is really fast. We're really paying attention to what's going on in the mind. That's when we can see those images that pop up. We can see that red flash of color and how it affects us. I, I really so. like the way the way you, you phrase that. I think that's really going to help me in my practice. I've noticed that a lot of the time I'm 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 clinging to something. I don't know always what it is, but I'm clinging to something and it's preventing me from um, finding like peace and happiness in the moment. But it's like um, reframing it as as you want to be clinging to whatever's <laughs> arising so it's the clinging has to has to always be changing that's i think that's going to be really helpful for me that's that's really great robert i'm glad that this is of value to you in fact i'm looking at the screen now and i'm seeing all of these smiling faces so this this talk must have been some value because the only one that i see that's not smiling is mr anonymous behind you Robert, on your wall. He's the only one that's <laughs> smiling. <laughs> yeah, John. Yeah, I just find it amazing. Um, you, you talked about Ajahn Samedo picking up the 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 what do you call it? The thermos of tea. Uh huh. That his attendant forgot to add in the hot water, and he immediately tipped tipped it out. Right, you picked Incredible. it up and turned yeah. it over, and then all yeah. the monks were really amazed. Well, he could feel he could feel that that. That that coffee pot yeah. or that uh, thermos 
mm. was too light. It didn't have the water in it. And he <laughs> realized that as yeah. he was picking it up. That's why he could pick it up and just turn it upside down and have only tea leaves come out of it. And everybody <laughs> was impressed. How would he know that that... <laughs> Yeah. It was also possibly he could feel not just the heaviness was missing, the but also the heat. The heat as he was yeah, the, the radiation. As soon yeah. as it's cold, it's not supposed to be cold. And so <laughs> that's that's instant. That's sharp. I really like that story about yeah. our And I like how you mentioned the high-speed cameras, too. Um, yeah. Ties in really well. Okay, so the, uh, the outcome of this talk is, is that look closely, because things are happening quick. <laughs> Here's another one that's like that, and that is is that they're in, uh, I think this happened before the turn of the century, back in the 1880s, 1890s, they had a lot of horse racing. Horse racing was like the number one sport throughout the United States. And one of the big things that came up about it is, does these race or any of these racehorses, do they ever have all four hooves off the ground? Are they ever airborne completely? Or are they always having at least one foot on the ground? Well, this was an argument that nobody could answer. They had tons of money put on it. And finally, what they did is they took a series of cameras and put them on each of the posts on the fence and had it with trip wires. And they tested this so that they finally were able to take a photo of a racehorse that had all four of his feet off the ground. But humans couldn't see that. We could. I mean, there was just so many arguments. Yes, the horse is airborne. No, the horse is never airborne. He's always got one foot on the ground. We know that cheetahs, they leap. They run with leaping. But horses, they don't. But are they still able to have all of their hooves off the ground in any one particular instant of time, say a tenth of a second or so? The answer is yes. But they had to use cameras because the human mind, the human eyes weren't fast enough to make that determination. If the human eye was fast enough to make that determination, it would have never been a big betting issue the way that it was. With tens of thousands of dollars in those days, that would have been millions of dollars betting bet over whether the horses are ever airborne or not. And no one's got any way of proving it until they set up a whole bunch of cameras. So it was that important for them. So this is another example of how fast things happen. And we often argue with each other over things that nobody saw happen because they happened too fast. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yes, it's it's um it's uh ignorance, isn't it? It ties into mm -hmm. ignorance. We missed it. We didn't see it happen because we are we it, weren't sharp enough, we weren't fast enough. And so we have to make up a story about it. <laughs> wow, that's that's Instead of just saying, I, I don't know. I don't know whether the horses can fly or not for an instant. <laughs> but anyway, guys, this has been going about an hour and a half. This has been a great call. I really appreciate it. And, and uh, Carl, I want to especially thank you for your first word. Because that's what this whole uh, um, video has been about, is the word sense. in the meaning of things have happened, a big event. Well, in those events, how many little tiny events happened in order to make that big event? In other words, when a student really does have an epiphany, when they really, really do feel good in their, uh, in their meditation and go running to the teacher to tell him how good it was, what was the sequence of events that brought that about? It's possibly that the student got so tired of working so hard that he finally relaxed. And when he relaxed, then he had the epiphany. And mm -hmm. he didn't even recognize that he had relaxed. He just quit. And then he had, you know, the re actually the epiphany was nothing but the release of the pressure that he had himself on. <laughs> and so we don't have to use the word sense. We can see that everything is just constantly in motion. There is no one event more important than the other. What makes an important event important is the fact that we're holding it, keeping it, repeating it over and over and over again, just like that example with the coffee cup. That coffee cup wasn't heavy when I picked it up and it wasn't heavy when I held it, but after five minutes, it's going to get really heavy. And then an hour later, it's going to be really, really heavy. 
and our mind is exactly the same way. And so when we can see how heavy these things are that we carry, let's throw them out. We don't have to be on that kind of visual every second, but we can begin to see how um, things happen really fast. So you don't have to have that kind of uh, striving to see how fast things are, but we can persistently look and then we'll catch it just like finally a camera caught uh, the hooves off the ground. They were persistently just taking a whole lot of photos until they finally got one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Damarasa. This talk's been really, um, really inspiring. I've really enjoyed this one. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. It's really re re reinvigorated my practice. Yeah, guys, shoot out as well. Thank you, guys. OK, well, um, guys, thank just, you so just, much. Go ahead. One more. I do have one quick question, which is. Um, uh, you mentioned a mind moment is a tenth of a second. Does that sort of mean like the like the frame rate of like perception is like one tenth of a second? Yeah, you could say the frame rate of our perceptions is about a tenth of a second. And this is why old movies were called flicks because the human eye can see the flicker when they were running at 10 frames a second. Sometimes videos are still done at 10 frames a second, and then you can see that flickering. But when you run film at 24 or 30 frames a second, the human eye can't see that flickering in there. Now, the flickering right. was especially predominant because in videos nowadays, they will hold an image for that uh, tenth of a second or the 24th of a second, and then electronically, they'll immediately change it. When I say immediately, that's saying within, um, oh, just a few milliseconds of electronic time, all of those pixels can be changed. But in the old days with film, they actually had a shutter in front that was uh, operating like a fan. And this shutter would go round and round, and it had parts that were black and parts that were white. So that the, as it spun, you could see the light, and then the, uh, um, uh, the arc, uh, light would shoot through the lens and the film, and then this frame would stop and it would go black. And then that was when the the shutter, which are uh, the uh, uh, the film machine, would then jump it. That's why they clatter. They clatter because every tenth of a second is going to move that frame, and then the uh, uh, um, the fan blade is going to be open so that you can see it. Then it closes, moves the next frame. And so that's the sequence in these old projectors. And because mm. of the speed of it, the human eye can catch that flickering. But when we run the speed fast enough, then the eye cannot determine the speed. So that's one of the reasons why we know the speed of the eye is because of the number of frames a second of a movie. There's also, uh, you can go on the internet and find, um, uh, you can go for reaction time, just Google reaction time, and you can find programs there that will have like a red view, and then they'll turn it green. And, you, and as soon as you see it turn green, you're supposed to click the mouse, and this program will, will find out how fast your reaction time is. That sounds really fun. That sounds okay, really well, fun, actually. We Buddhists know that it's going to take two mind moments. One is to see that it changed from red to green. And then the second mind moment is the actual clicking of the mouse. So uh, the, about the best reaction times that humans can have is about 200 my, uh, milliseconds. Now, slow people, when they first start this, uh, are going to be operating at about 300 milliseconds. They're slow. But uh, uh, the one that I saw says that at 200 milliseconds, that's black belt karate speed. If you can do that reaction time to 200 milliseconds. And then Olympic champions are going to be down to about 180. Or about a ninth of a, uh, 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 let us say, one eleventh of a second. So that you got wow. 11. Okay, wow. and that's 180. So that's reaction time. So go play with this reaction time. It's actually quite a lot of fun. To see, oh, can yeah. you act? Yeah, no, can I'm going to do that. Actually, that sounds like uh, quite enjoyable. Because sounds that like teaches a, you how fast, practice. how fast things are and how the mind is actually slow. The human mind is a slow machine. Compared to reality, reality is fast. Our perception yeah, of reality it's, is slow. Um, 
an, another interesting concept, not to keep everyone here too long, but another interesting concept is um, um, it, uh, it, it, studies have found that playing video games increases people's reaction speed and mm -hmm. like um, sort of really high level gamers or like esports uh, e competitors, they enter a sort of um, Janet kind of flow state when they play games where they're not thinking, they're just like reacting. They're really absorbed or really concentrated on Precisely. the game. Precisely. We just, do that in martial arts. State, it's really. called, it's yeah. called flow. That if yes, you flow, are yeah. having a boxing match with someone because of the sport or whatever, and you start thinking about Aunt Susie and the argument you had, you're going to have a face full of boxing glove. You're, you're not paying attention to what's happening. Well, that's exactly what happens when people start to play video games. They're only paying attention part of the time. But as you gain uh, skill in the, in the game, what that means is you just simply are paying more and more close attention to what's going on, and you can go into these flow states, which are natural jhanas, natural flow mm. states. Formula One racers, if they're not in that flow state, they're going to be dead before they get to the end of the, uh, around the track. The example is, is that you've got the Formula One, he's running somewhere between 175 and 200 miles an hour on this straight, and some old little old lady walks out on the track. You know, in Europe, they do that. They put bales of hay and whatnot. In America, they put them in stands to keep them off the track, but in uh, European Formula One racing, it's a real road that they're using, and so people can wander out. As that race star carver sees that woman run out in front of him, and he has a thought, lady, you should not be on this track. He just killed her. The thought it took for him to say, lady, you're not supposed to be here is enough time that it takes that that car is going to kill her. He's got to react much faster than that. He's got to see that woman on the track and then not think about her being on the track, but rather think of swerving the car out of the way to keep from hitting her. These are our reaction times. Well, if you can do that as a Formula One driver, maybe you can do that with your own thoughts. When the old lady runs out on your own track of your own mind, don't run over her. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a fun way to think of it as well, as it's like you're you're it's like a sport, you know, you're you're playing the sport of seeing how that's fast exactly you can throw right, the right, right, right. It, it, That's the whole point. Make this thing a game. It's not heavy. Yeah. We've been taught that it's heavy, but it's not. All we have to do is put that cup down. It's not heavy when we set it down. It's when we're holding it that it's heavy and we keep holding it, et cetera, like that. So anyway, this has been a good talk, guys. Let's finish now. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Marcus, for being on. And I really appreciate your um, um, input. And I especially thank you, Carl, because you gave the whole point using that word sense. So be careful of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, yeah, you. thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Robert, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.